Welcome to the Undocu Hustle Show. I am your host, Alejandro Flores Munoz. And today, I'm really excited to record this video. It's going to be my first reaction video. And I, in fact, I'm actually reacting to a, re a reaction video of my interview from CNBC Millennial Money. I haven't done a reaction video before, but I am particularly interested in reacting to this video because um, Stephen Graham, who uh, uploaded this video reacting to Millennial Money, he's done this many for every single Millennial Money, I think, and I've actually watched him before. Uh, he has some really good points of view from the business aspects out of things, so I'm really curious to hear what his response is to my uh, Millennial Money feature which we talk about about many different things. Specifically, I talk about undoc the undocu hustle and the disparities that there are between uh, you know, first generation or immigrant entrepreneurs versus those who have generational wealth and who have um, just an easier time when thinking about starting up. So with that said, let's get into watching this video and see what Graham's reaction is. As an undocumented immigrant, I can still make a living in this country, I can still survive and I can still contribute not only to the social economic of this country, but the cultural growth of this country. Look at that, he's got a cannon, it looks like a cannon, I, I don't know, 70D. He's basically got the same camera I had, and it looks like too, he's got, uh, what is he working on there? Hmm, okay. Anyway, we're gonna find out. He, uh, he's into photography or YouTube videos. Uh, let's see. My name is Alejandro Flores Munoz. I am 31 years old. I make $46,000 a year. And I live in Denver, Colorado. He's so far right. What about the camera? Most That's of the pretty good rent. $620 a month rent. You know, I gotta say though, maybe it's just because I'm in Los Angeles, where I'm, I'm sure like something like a studio apartment in LA, like in this area would be like twenty one, twenty two hundred dollars a month. It's insane. So I see in comparison six hundred twenty dollars a month. I'm like, wow, what a good deal. But in all seriousness, he's paying, he's making forty six thousand a year, paying six twenty a month. That's, that's pretty good rent, and uh, yeah, he should be saving a decent amount of money on that. I am. So this is one of the uh, most of the comments that I see both on Millennial Money, the YouTube uh, clip and on Graham's reaction video is people asking like how did he find a $620 rent or people even saying it's fake that I'm not that it's not real. First of all, the producers from the show CNBC Millennial Money did their due diligence. I had to submit my 2019 taxes. I had to submit my bank statements, my transactions. So all of the things that are being covered here were um, scrutinized by the producers uh, from the show. Uh, so yes, I do pay $620 and yes, it is unheard of. In Denver, specifically where I live, I live in Cap Hill. And uh, I just got lucky. I just got lucky and I haven't moved from here. It is also an apartment. It doesn't come with many amenities. So, yeah, 620. The co-owner of Stokes Poke Food Truck, a local food truck here in the center of downtown Denver. Reminds me of the Stokes Twins. <laughs> That's probably not something he wants to be associated with right now. But, oh, man, I love, I love Pokey. Po pokey. Pokey? Poke. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I love that. It's so good because... The thing with that is that it's it's way cheaper than sushi. Like for for sushi here, it's like fifteen dollars for a big roll, but for like a big bowl, like the like the large bowl of pokey is like fourteen bucks, and it's way more food, way more fish, way better of a deal. I love it. We were able to grow the business when we bought it for forty thousand dollars to at the end of twenty nineteen, grossing one hundred ninety six thousand dollars. What's what's the net on that? Those businesses are hard to scale. That's the thing. They're so time intensive. Uh, they save money on rent, at least, with some of the food trucks. You got a kiosk, but uh, it's just, it's a scaling problem. You get to a point eventually where you have to start franchising off and then you collect franchise fees. I, it's, it's an interesting business. Cousins Maine Lobster was the one that I, I love. I so he uh, asked right here, wonder what his you know profits on those are. So we've been figuring out that our margins are 60-40. So 60% profit, 40% cost. Um, we are able to keep those margins so low because we are operating off of a food truck, first of all. So he's right. We do save uh, money from not having that huge overhead cost from a brick and mortar. Um, and also another thing that allows us to... Um, 
you know, have a low overhead is that we have a shared kitchen model where I rent a kitchen space off of an existing bar uh, and I'm able to not only uh, make my food, prepare my food in that kitchen store, uh, the things that I need uh, for to run this operation, but also I'm able to sell the food to people from the bar. And actually, my kiosk is located outside in the parking lot of the shared kitchen or the bar. Um, so I'm able to really utilize that and um, allow me to keep my, my margins uh uh, lower, um, so be able to make some better profit. So yeah, we're at sixty forty. Love it. It's expensive though, but it's so good. Once the pandemic hit, we saw drastic changes. We went from doing anywhere from three hundred and fifty to five hundred bowls on an any given day to only pulling in roughly fifty bowls a day. Ooh, that's got to be rough. But I'm wondering. It seems like some of these restaurants around me, at least. Their business now is, like, booming with these, like, takeout orders right now and, like, delivery services. Not everybody, obviously, but some of these businesses, you pull up and there's, like, a line out the door with people just wanting to get takeout food. It's actually pretty incredible, so I'm curious to see if that was just, like, a temporary slump for him or if businesses started to pick back up once, like, delivery services and takeout started. Because in the beginning, yeah, everyone was freaked out, but now people are starting to realize, like, wait a second, I get takeout, that's okay. So we are still in a slump and I think like the restaurant industry in general is one that has been affected the most about from this pandemic. Um, and however, and then he mentions about takeout and, um, you know, as a food truck, inherently we have this model, the food, the to go curbside kind of model. So that has been played in our favor. Uh, however, the um, delivery apps, those are tricky and they're tricky because they charge anywhere from 20 to 30 percent fees on top of already your cost of goods and all those things uh, to be able to you know sell on that platform sell on that platform I before the pandemic I stopped using all of those um, delivery apps and I actually integrated my own system to be able to order online for pickup eliminating um those delivery apps and also um not having to take you know take on those those charges those those fees now that the pandemic has hit i have gone back to two of those uh, and i've decided to go back because you know people already have these apps and so the way that i'm looking at it is that i am you know it would have cost me money to um obtain that customer somehow some way for me if i was to try to obtain to get that customer myself but instead what i'm choosing to do is i'm choosing to pay those 20 percent 30 percent fees to the grub hubs and uber eats of the world so that i can get in front of that customer and my hope is that i will be able to retain that customer and eventually lead them to my website so that that i'll have to no longer be relying on those uh apps and uh, funnel them directly to my website Let's see. Let's see how much he's charging here. Uh, that's actually a pretty decent price. Spicy Pokey 9, Shoyu 9, Surf and Turf 9. He's got good prices. I wish they would come to like Venice Beach. So yes, we have good prices. And again, that's again because of the uh, model that we're playing, that we're using. We are using a very low price. Uh, overhead model which allows us to also reduce our prices we don't have to be spending those three four five thousand dollars for a brick and mortar that you would have to pay and so our overhead is lower allowing us to provide a lower price point as well for our product but more importantly we made that decision because we consciously uh, decided to move into the Westwood side of town, which is predominantly a Hispanic, um, uh, even low-income immigrant neighborhood. And so we wanted to make sure that also our prices reflected that neighborhood. Um, and we continue to carry on those prices throughout uh, all of our systems because, again, of our margins. That would be awesome. I would buy it. I would buy it. A lot of pokey. Not only losing about 95% of our business right now, it's picking back up, but losing that much really hurt us. And recently, our food truck was also hit by a drunk driver. Our food truck right now is in the auto body shop. I am estimating that in total, we're going to lose about 
about five weeks of being able to operate the food truck, which also results in loss of revenue. Yeah, except, say, oh man, okay, so something like that, you usually have some sort of insurance for that, because if that basically is your office, ideally, now in the future, what you would do is you would get that insured against business loss. Like, I actually have this business insurance. It's, it's kind of stupid, honestly, to pay for it. But it protects me in, in, in the event of, like, an outage beyond my control. If something happens like that, there's, like, some big outage of, like, whatever it is, I think the insurance company will pay me, like, a few thousand dollars a day uh, just to try to make up for that outage. I don't know if that's ever going to be a reality, but with a lot of these businesses, they will actually pay you for downtime for stuff like this that happens. That way it's not just car insurance, but it's also a business insurance on top of that. And it's a write-off, so stuff like that is also very important to have. So so this was, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, you know, 2020 is the year that everything can go wrong. We not only got, you know, we weren't able to open up for a few months because of the pandemic, uh, stay at home orders and all that stuff. But when we were getting ready to uh, get our food truck back up and running, specifically summer months are our prime months. We're selling poke out in the summer in a 1978 BW bus. So like this is perfect timing for us. But we got hit by a drunk driver. Our Buzz had to go to the auto body shop and it was actually there for 10 weeks. I just got it back like three days ago. So we lost 10 weeks of being able to operate and Graham is right. We thankfully had insurance which allowed us to uh, be able to not only get the the food truck fully um, repaired, no, none, nothing out of our pockets, but then also we were able to claim loss of revenue for 10 weeks. Uh, of course, I had to uh, submit uh, proof that we were really generating that much money. I had to submit my 2019 taxes. I had to submit my daily reports for my Square dashboard. Um, I had to submit uh, just various information that would back up that we we're really losing um, revenue because of this accident. And we are right now still negotiating on how much we're gonna get back, but we are gonna get back some money for that time loss. So yes, get business insurance, absolutely. The time I had a savings account was in 2018, and I had a savings of about $5,000. I used that money to buy into the food truck business Stokes Pocket. Okay, so we got 620 rent, that, that's good. Side hustles, what's this? $500 side hustles. Podcast and video equipment, hiring freelancers, supplies. $500 a month. That's, that's actually, that's a big budget. Unless it's just like a few months, like he pays like two grand and he's done. That seems like a lot. It depends how much he's making on that. If he's spending fine, he's making like 1500 back. That's good, let's see. Food, food $400 a month, groceries, restaurants. I would say he's actually probably spending a little bit too much for food. Four dollars a month, especially with with. I, I wonder how much he can get his food for at wholesale cost, given that he runs a, basically a restaurant. So that is something I would absolutely say he could probably get down to like I don't know three hundred a month. So he says a hundred dollars a month there. Transportation three ninety seven. Wow. Car payment, gas, car insurance. What is he driving? The transportation could also probably come down a little bit more. I don't know what he's driving. If he's if he got like a good deal on a used car with zero percent interest, like then maybe that makes sense. But transportation is another one that, that's a bit too much. Phone, one hundred and fifty dollars a month for a phone. That is also very high. I pay. I think it's like eighty five dollars a month for unlimited everything with my phone through T Mobile, and that's like unlimited calling, texting, which doesn't matter anyway. Unlimited data. It's the data. It's the data you really pay for. Who who makes phone calls anymore? Seriously, it's all it's all iMessage and just watching YouTube videos. That's all I really pay for anyway. That's too high. Utilities one thirty a month for a studio apartment. I, I guess it's okay. Laundry. Wow, ninety dollars a month for laundry. Why is that so high? That seems really high. Like even if he's going to a laundromat, I I don't know, fifteen dollars a month at a laundromat. That that's high. Wi Fi fifty five dollars. That's fine. Travel forty two. Monthly average calculated for manual spending. Okay, that's fine. Subscription, 68. Amazon, Spotify, Soylent. Soylent would count as a food, though, wouldn't it? So wouldn't that kind of go in his food budget? Anyway, my only complaints here, food it could get down a little bit. Transportation might be able to come down a little bit. Phone should be able to come down a little bit. And laundry should be able to come down a little bit. Right there, you should be able to save, I don't know, 250 a month extra on top of that? Maybe. Let's see. Bye. All right, Mr. Graham. So... First of all, his uh, the infographic that he put 
to uh, to his YouTube video is saying four hundred dollars being spent on food, um, and so that's the big thing. Like you're spending four hundred dollars worth of food. First of all, I work really hard for that money, and uh, if you think about it, I go to a restaurant you know once a week or twice a week. Let's say I buy lunch and a margarita or two. You're looking at forty to forty five dollars. So. Yes, I am spending a little more, but if I want to have a margarita, I'm going to have a margarita and, you know, it is what it is. Um, in terms of the car, I drive a 2018 Chevy Spark. Um, and this is one thing that I need to get better at, is I need to be get better at differ, uh, um, splitting the cost of things between my personal stuff and the business. There's many, many times where I'll just use my personal card, debit card, instead of using the business. And then I, you know, it's just a lot of that, uh, that I need to get a lot better at or, um, and, and the car, half of it is paid through the business and half of it is paid through me. Um, and so I pay like 280 for the car payment and then another hundred and something for insurances and gas and service and all that stuff. So 397, you know, that's where the car is. Uh, where else does he got you mentioned? Oh, laundry. Yeah, that's, a, that's another one. Um, it is $90, but it's a fold and wash service. I, you know, decided to buy back my time. And sometimes I decide that doing pain to do the laundry is better than, you know, me spending whatever hours it takes to do laundry. Um, and then, oh, side hustle one. Yes, I $500 on side hustle. So that one, um, sort of what he mentioned is I do do a, like a lump sum of how much I'm going to spend. Uh, for example, one of this, this years, what I did is I bought a lot of um, a restock of sunglasses for my sunglasses website, unamsunglasses.com. Uh, and also I spend things on like coaching. I want to get some coaching or figuring out like a course on marketing on different things like that. I include that in side hustle, um, or, uh, paying a freelancer on fiverr.com to create a, uh, marketing strategy for my speaking, speaking business. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit of that. Um, I, I got to get a little bit better as to how I, um, organize my finances with this, but there's, there's where it goes. Still haven't been able to get back into a savings mode because I have been utilizing a lot of our profits, not only from paying myself a low salary, but also any profits that are coming in from the business. We're just putting them back. Right now, it's pretty much all lumped in making sure that the business continues to scale up and grow, specifically during the pandemic. I agree with that. I think he's on the right track with his business. He's smart like that. He's not taking the money and spending it. He's got to figure out a way, like, how long is that going to take him to really become profitable from this? But he, the thing is, he's got to open multiple locations at this point. Like, I've met some people who have owned pokey places that actually make a pretty decent living, but they do so by having multiple locations. Like, you never see people just operating only one. They're operating, like, eight to ten. And their schedules are packed, by the way. So it's a lot of work, but really that's the only way I think he's going to be able to grow to like the next level. He's got to expand. Yes, I agree with Graham on here that you have to have multiple sources of revenue, uh, specifically if you want to scale up. Uh, however, I do not agree that it has to be through locations, multiple locations. Um, because you have to think about that if you have multiple locations, you're increasing your overhead. Really, your, your um, operating costs will go off the roof. Uh, so what we have done here is we, have, we started just as a food truck. But then we added catering services, so that's another source of revenue that's coming in now. We added the kiosk. We then also added pop-ups where we go inside. Right now, we go inside Amazon uh, during their uh, lunch breaks for their employees. We are set up in the break room where we sell um, our food to the employees both um, and during lunch and dinner service. Those kinds of things is that we're expanding how many... Um, sources of revenue we can uh, obtain uh, while all always uh, operating out of the same operating cost because we're operating out of the same kitchen so all of those things are coming out of the same kitchen and in addition to that so I just uh, named four of those sources the other one we did is we added a new menu with a brand new name so we're combi tacos as well it's our virtual kitchen you cannot find a location. You cannot walk up and find our menu anywhere. Uh, however, you can find us online. You can book us for pop-ups. You can book us for 
catering. Um, and we're also right now in the development of putting them up on the um, online platform. So it has its own website. Everything is the same, and it's coming out of the same kitchen. So we're running Stokes Poke out of the kitchen and also our virtual kitchen. So we have about six to seven various ways that we are generating income. So, um, and, uh, you know, if we're running all of those in one day, that's ideal. Right now with the pandemic, we've only operating one or two, but, you know, just think about it. We're able to run all of those in the same day, every single day. It's, you know, it's good money. He's basically going all or nothing with his business. You know, I gotta say, like, he's not doing anything wrong with the business per se. But uh, there's got to there's got to be. I, I know he has a plan. He he seems too smart not to have a plan and just to be taking this like month by month. I just I'm curious what the plan is to grow the business. When I was younger, I sometimes felt a little bit embarrassed of the work that my mom was doing, selling perfumes and selling jewelry on the side or selling cheesecakes door to door. All of that to me felt like we were doing it out of necessity, and it really didn't click to me. When I was younger, that it was actually an entrepreneurship spirit that lived in my mom. By her trying to survive, she was teaching me entrepreneurship traits. You know what? He's got a good presence about him. He could be one of those like motivational speakers. You know, he just he's got a good presence to him. Gotta admit that. So to point uh, to point out uh, what he asked earlier is that I wonder what he's gonna do to scale up. Um, so I was mentioning the you know. Ex, you know, casting a white net is what I call it by having catering, pop-ups, food truck, kiosk. But then also, I've been thinking of how I can duplicate this model, almost like a franchise thing, um, but with just this specific model with my own business. So I have relatives, all my family lives in California, Orange County, Santa Ana, California. And I can, you know, I before the pandemic, I was dabbling and figuring out how I can duplicate this model in California um, so I can give my little brother some employment. You know, all of us work as a family. And after doing all my research and everything, I came about with, a, you know, I would need about $5,000 to get this off the ground in California. And I'm talking about just two things, uh, online catering and then also pop-ups. Um, and so those two things I would be able to get off the ground fairly easy with about $5,000. Three of the $3,000 in um, business fees and taxes and things that you know that you would need requirement certifications and things like that and another two thousand dollars in uh, buying like the Cambrio uh, heat warmers and things that you would need to be a caterer or a pop-up person um, so that's what I'm thinking and that's what I, I that's my next step in growing the business um, this next thing that we're gonna talk that I'm gonna talk about I think this is where I made the most uh, impact in this video where I connected the most. Um, so I'm excited to see what he says about this. Oh, my mom never sat me down and said, Mijo, here is the return on investment that we're going to get today. And here's how I came about it. Here's the business plan that I wrote. Or here's a marketing strategy that I'm going to do. None of that ever existed. And I think that's why a lot of our community continues to and be able to scale up is because we don't have the resources. Yeah, you know what? I mean, that's, that's probably true. And uh, it's all learning experience. Now, he can take these experiences and then pass this on to like the next generation. Be like, hey, we got to get minimum 25% <laughs> cash on cash return. Otherwise, you're out of the house. You know, that's what, get a good kick in the pants there. But no, seriously, uh, all of these experiences he's taking now, it's probably going to take a little bit longer to learn. But once he learns them in, I mean, his motivation is so strong, so like, I, I have no doubt he's going to come out of this perfectly fine, even better than before. So, it's not probably true, it is true. Generational wealth it is a real thing that exists that makes it easier for people to grow, their scale their businesses, you know, getting a small business loan for a million dollars kind of a thing, or even having access to bank accounts or getting loans uh, for from banks. Those are those are obstacles that we as first generations undocumented immigrants, um, immigrants in this country often lack. And so therefore the uh, starting line for entrepreneurship for a person of color, an immigrant, a first generation person, a documented person, it is way, way behind than somebody who has uh, built generational wealth in this country. And so that's where I talk about the Endocu hustle and talking about that our people can survive in this country 
and we can do more than just survive. We can scale up our businesses if we had the resources, if we had the opportunities for loans, if we had the knowledge on how to scale up and just various things that can sometimes seem, seem so easy or so attainable that you don't realize how hard and difficult they can be for an undocumented person. Here's where the lived experiences from a millionaire and people like us are. He has to go back all the way to middle school to think about somebody reselling things as small as it seems to him is candy. I can tell you now that I know a lot of people in this country and right now undocumented folks in this country, immigrants folks in this country who even sell candy to this day to be able to make a living. We resell, you know, we're wholesalers, resellers. I come from a family of merchants. My mom, uh, you know, resold perfumes and, and, and uh, blankets. And uh, where we started seeing some money is when my mom started making her own product and then, re and then selling that. That's where you were able to see a lot more of the profit. But, you know, you don't have to dig that far to see, um, you know, these type of businesses that he's talking about right now, they seem like, you know, almost like children businesses, yet our immigrant community sometimes only has these micro, super small type of hustles that can be scalable. You can grow a reselling candy business. You can grow that, but you can't do that if you don't have the resources, if you don't know how to create a website or how to put platforms in place where you can charge people uh, with a credit card. Uh, just simple things that um, might seem like uh, very basic or very, very like micro startup um, are things that our community right now needs. Um, and that's where I refer to right now as like doing your side hustle and selling things. We can do it. We've been doing it. And we get all these experiences from sales. No, my laptop just died. Shoot. Hopefully I can get it back. I have zero student loans because I never pursued a four-year education. I am now more than ever glad that I made that decision because I, as a business owner, don't need any degrees to be able to grow the business. Yeah, I agree with that. You know what? He's probably way further ahead than a lot of people his age when you're accounting for student debt. So I think he probably made the right decision for what he wants to do. He doesn't need a college degree. A lot of that, I think, is just going to be learned on the job. Now that I'm my business owner and I don't have any insurances, it's made me realize how important healthcare is. As an undocumented immigrant, also that can be a barrier to be able to obtain some health insurances. Yeah, it's so expensive for health insurance. It's even even for me, I pay how much do I pay now? It's like two fifty, I think, a month. For, for really nothing. It's basically just a catastrophic plan where if something were to happen to me, I pay the first like seven to $8,000 out of pocket and then anything over that is taken care of, but it covers nothing. So really the first set, it's, it's only in case something horrible happens, knock on wood, that doesn't happen. Then, then I just, it basically protects me from bankruptcy if something crazy were to happen, but it's just so unbelievably expensive right now. So unfortunately the, the pandemic you know, from day one, actually, from day one, I always wanted to look into what it 
means and what is the process of making sure that I have insurance, but at the same time, my staff and um, everyone in my business. Uh, and, you know, it's something that ends up becoming a second thing that you think about before all the other stuff that you're doing to run your business. That's where it's come to me. Um, but from the beginning, uh, my partner and I, business partner and I decided that we wanted to pay our staff a living wage because we understand how important some of these, um, you know, sometimes you're looking at them as uh, privileges or opportunities to have, like health care and a living wage and all those things. They are uh, essential. Um, and so... It is something that is in the forefront of uh, me as I expand and grow my business to figure out this process. I made it my mission to not only show others who ever asks me or sends me a message, hey Alejandro, how were you able to do this? How were you able to import things from China to the United States? To show them that process, but also I've taken it now to a different step where I go into colleges and universities and I speak to folks who are also undocumented or documented and I talk about the undocu hustle. Oh, that's why he's so good at speaking. <laughs> Obviously, he's had a lot of practice talking to other people and sharing his story. He's a really good speaker. So I have a feeling he's going to be able to continue that like even further. And, and regardless of what happens with like his business, he can always have a career in uh, motivational speaking, I think. I when I l Let me talk a little bit further about this as well, which is that when I share the undocu hustle or my processes, I am sharing them because I don't see other undocu hustlers as, as competition. I see them as a way for us to be able to build generational wealth. And the only way that we can build generational wealth is if we have the processes, the information, the knowledge to be able to grow or start up our businesses. Just to give a quick example, I had one of my friends, an undocu hustler, who contacted me and said, hey Alejandro, I want to sell sunglasses on my website, right? Like four years ago, five years ago, I would have thought that as like, I'm not going to share my information with my competitors, what am I nuts? Right. And now my mentality is, of course, I'm going to share my information. And not only am I going to share the information on how to start it, I actually lend him my wholesaler's license so that he can quickly buy those shades and then start rev generating revenue to be able to then eventually get all his own uh, proper um, wholesaler licenses and all that stuff. But uh, essentially, that is my model, is to be able to build generational wealth by sharing our knowledge that we have and not hoarding it. Uh, and so that's what I do when I, when I speak at uh, colleges and universities. So if you're an event planner or you're a coordinator of a program, hit me up uh, on docuhustleshow.com where you can get more information on how to book me to speak or give presentations on the Andocu Hustle. It's basically showcasing my journey, what I've gone through, the things that I have done. And I'm actually in the, in the process of finishing up the, uh, a book called uh, No Papers, No Fear, We Can Do Business Here, uh, which is essentially sharing some steps that I've taken to start up, whether that be business licenses, marketing strategies, how I landed on millennial money, uh, just different strategies that I've done that I'm going to share. And it's going to be a free book. I'm going to give that away for free because because again, we gotta build generational wealth and community wealth. We all have enough to be able to live a comfortable lifestyle, but at the same time, I am driving and I am envisioning a lifestyle where I'm gonna be able not only to just have enough to survive, but enough to be able to really create generational wealth and create community wealth for not only for myself, but for my family and my community. Yeah, you know, it's good. He's just gotta find a way to scale that business because as it is right now, he's he's gonna be working himself nonstop to try to grow this bit. It's just it's gotta make money. I understand right now so it's a very difficult time. But there's, there's got to be something he could do to increase sales, save more money in that, open up another spot, maybe try to get some sort of franchise going on that. I'm not sure how viable that is for a place like Because here's the thing. With Pokey like this, the business model is, is almost like you could copy and paste it. And what people really pay for is a brand name. So he's really got to get like a good brand going behind it where people know that brand and then – want to go specifically for that like we have here in los angeles we have sweet fin pokey and we have mainland pokey people kind of know both of those names so they'll go out of their way to go to one of those places it's like go to mcdonald's if you want to like you know that brand name mcdonald's so that's where the franchise really comes into effect like you can't just have one business and then be like oh i want a franchise because 
anyone will be like, well, why am I going to pay you 15% when just selling pokey? Here, here's the structure of it. I'm just going to do it myself in my own name. So there's got to be some sort of benefit on that. So I think... I agree with him on the branding side of things. You know, branding is essentially what's going to continue to live on, whether your business succeeds or not. We're seeing a bunch of brands right now from back in the day coming back up where they weren't selling any more shoes or they stopped selling their clothes and then they didn't become popular. But what stuck around was their branding. So I agree with him on branding. It's really important. And I have been emphasizing and focusing a lot on branding. Um, so... The one thing here is on franchising, where it's, uh, here's again, a mentality coming from somebody who has access to capital versus somebody who doesn't have access to capital. That's me, right? Being able to create a franchise and become a franchisee or whatever it's called, you have to have capital. Um, I'm thinking that it would take at least 150 to 200,000 for me to be able to create the systems and the models and the processes and everything to be a viable franchise. Uh, and that's just not attainable at the moment for me. Um, and so, although I think that, you know, long term, probably that would be a cool idea to have right now, continuing to spread and cast a white net by um, creating more sources of revenue is the way that I see myself scaling up and what I recommend others to do. Um, because especially if you lack access to capital, which often, you know, the undocu hustlers that I'm talking to and my audience. We're in that boat. We're in that shoe. Grow his brand a little bit more first, and then he can start looking into expanding further. But uh, other than that, I think he's doing a great job. He's a real hustler. He's uh, got a great motivational story behind him. I, I think he's a good speaker, too. So he's got a lot going for him, mm. and I think no matter what, he's going to be successful in pretty much anything he does. So anyway, with that said, you guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. As always, make sure to destroy the like button, subscribe button, and note. Awesome. Well... There you have it. This is my first reaction to uh, a reaction video of uh, myself. Uh, but I think I'll continue to do some of these reaction videos and kind of do what he does uh, with Millennial Money, but give it my perspective. My perspective where, you know, access to capital is the perspective from a millionaire to somebody who is making $46,000 and how to scale things up is way different, right? I'm going to be more innovative, I feel like. I'm going to have different points of view because I'm lacking one of the most essential parts of scaling a business, capital. Uh, but it can be done regardless of capital and it can be done regardless of your immigration status too. Um, so thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe. Let me know what you thought about this, my first reaction video, where I can improve. There's some people who have sent me some comments or like, Alejandro, you know, this is how you can improve your video. I'm like, yes, those are the advices that I really need. Not some of these hater comments that I've seen uh, in the comments of the Millennial Money video and comments in uh, his video as well. There's some haters out there. But nevertheless, um, I'm still here. I'm here to stay. And thank you very much for watching. Have a nice day.